We're now going to dive down to the next level and help you determine how to calculate your HFSS score using the nutrient profile model. To walk us all through that, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Louise Allen, Senior Executive of Diet and Health at the Food and Drink Federation. Louise's role includes striving for workable, evidence-based diet and health policy for the food and drink industry. In 20 years at the FDF, her work has included helping to shape school and nursery food standards, advising on reformulation policies and folic acid fortification. She is the FDF's lead on UK food and drink advertising rules, including the UK nutrient profiling model and its application, and also works closely with a number of advertising bodies to share knowledge. Louise, welcome and thank you. I shall hand over to you now. Thank you, Nadia, and thank you for inviting me to speak. It's great to be here talking to you all today. I will just share my screen. So my um, chat today, my, my uh, presentation today is just to go over um, how to calculate your HFSS score. I'll try and answer as many questions as possible. Um, please do use the chat function. And if I don't cover them all today, I will try and come back to you separately. Just a quick if, uh, update, if you don't know who we are, we're the membership body for food manufacturing in the UK. And we bring together companies and, uh, with government and stakeholders and support our members in trying to produce uh, high quality, safe, nutritious and affordable food and drink. And we have over a thousand members ranging from you know, our largest global brands to small innovative SMEs. bit of background on the nutrient profile model. So it was developed in 2005 by a panel of scientific experts commissioned by the Food Standards Agency. And this was specifically for the purpose of restricting advertising to children on TV. Today, the model is currently used to identify HFSS, that is products high in fat, salt and sugar, for the purposes of restricting advertising to children on TV. This has been in place since 2007. And to restrict advertising to children in non-broadcast media, such as cinema, print, internet, and outdoor advertising since 2017. As you know, in the future, the model will be applied to specific categories in scope um, to restrict the location of where products are in store and online from October this year, to restrict multi-buy offers in store and online from October next year, and to further restrict um, HFSS TV, so a 9pm watershed, and pay for our online advertising from January 2024. So what is the model and how do you use it? So the tables I've put on the left-hand side are directly from the government guidance. Hopefully you've seen these before, but if not, don't worry, I will put a link up to the guidance that will repeat everything I'm about to say. So um, the model is a scoring system where you use the nutrient information per 100 grams of your product to determine a score for a range of components. So you look at the nutrient information for your product per 100 grams and work out the scores for energy, saturated fat, sugars, and sodium, or so-called A nutrients. Do the sum of those and then take away the points scored for fruit, veg, nuts, fiber, and protein. You tot up your score, and if your final score is four or more, your food is HFSS, if it's a drink and it scores one or more, it's HFSS. The only other thing you need to consider is there is um, a safeguard that was put in the model to prevent products high in protein being classified as healthier due to their high protein content. So if your product does score 11 or more A points, you can't take away the score for protein. You can only take away the score for fruit, veg and nuts, and fiber. Again, there's an exception to that. Um, if your product scores 
five or more points for fruit, veg and nuts. So is over 80% fruit, veg and nuts, then the protein cap doesn't apply regardless of how many A points you have. So as I mentioned before, um, I put a QR code on there that does link to the government guidance. I will say that it's 11 years out of date. Um, the Department of Health and Social Care did say that it, it will be updated and certainly us alongside BRC have fed in uh, our thoughts and suggestions of the sort of things that it should include. In the meantime, however, there are many, many questions about how to calculate certain aspects of the model. I want to go through these very briefly now, and then um, I do have a couple of worked examples to try and address these in more detail later on. So firstly, is there a universal calculator available? The simple answer is no. Um, we have called on government to provide this which we hope would help companies using it for the very first time. In the meantime, uh, we have developed uh, a universal calculator as FDF. Um, well, it's available to our members and we've been using it for some time because of the advertising rules that were put into place uh, many years ago. Hopefully that streamlined the process a little, but if you're an FDF member and need to know more, then obviously I can share that with you. Um, is my product a food or drink? Sounds straightforward, but I'll come on to that. What can I count in my fruit, vegetable and nut calculation? This is really complex. Um, what about dried or pureed fruit? How do I deal with that? And how about if you've got a product where the nutrient information is given on pack as a volume per 100 ml, as opposed to the 100 gram that you have to use in your calculation? I have a worked example on this um, as well. And what nutrient information do I use? Is it as sold or as consumed, given the different ways that people um, consume a product? So how do I calculate the score for dry products, such as dessert mixers? And how do I calculate the score for a multi-pack or platter? Okay, just very briefly, because I've been asked about this, um, how do I deal with a yogurt? So there are things, drinking yogurts, which are essentially the same compositional standard of a yogurt without any additional liquids. I guess it's just the way that it's packaged that gives the intention that it's meant to be um, eaten without a spoon. So this is classified as a food and the HFSS scoring threshold is four. Slightly separately, you have a yogurt drink uh, where the um, guidance is if there are additional liquids, so added milk, juice or water, it should be classified as a drink and the HFSS scoring threshold is one. Um, meal replacement shakes have been asked about, but these are not in scope. So moving on to fruit, veg and nuts, how do you work out, because this is as a retailer, you don't have this information on pack. Um, as a manufacturer, you will obviously have the recipe information, so we'll be able to calculate this um, exactly and accurately. So, um, as I said, there is, in the technical guidance um, from the government, which is 11 years out of date, there is a link to more information on how to do this. However, the link has been broken for some time because this document has been archived. So what I did in a, in a rush yesterday was to try and um, put this on the FDF website available publicly. So if you scan the QR code with your camera on your phone, you should get a link to all of the guidance that I have spoken about today. Okay, so how do you work it out? The amount of fruit and veg in a product can be calculated before or after cooking. However, as most of you make composite products, all the ingredients should be in the same state. Um, you only count fruit and veg that is intact. So this is what the guidance says. So cooked and dried and those that are minimally processed. The examples in the guidance are given as peeled, sliced, tinned, frozen, juiced and purees. Pulses can also be counted. 
all nuts, including peanuts, can be counted. Coconut can be counted, but there are different rules depending on the component used. And the weight of dried fruit and veg used, um, you have to apply a multiplication to the weight of this. Um, there is an equation to use, which I will come on to later, but it accounts for the concentrated um, nutrients within the dried product or concentrated tomato puree. Not included are, crucially, fruit and veg that have been subject to further processing. The guidance doesn't, doesn't give a lot of information on this, but it does say concentrated fruit juice sugars, powders and leathers are not counted. And in line with the five-day guidance, potatoes and other starchy vegetables such as yams or cassava are not counted and um, seeds are not counted either. Now, also, there's a lot of unknowns with this, actually, and we've been working with our members to try and identify some of the things that we're not sure about. And we have given quite a long list to um, Department of Health and Social Care. So things like how do you treat pulse flour? What is a paste? What is a puree? Um, a clearer definition of um, minimally processed. So how do you treat things like juice infused cherries or fruit Kool-Aid? Um, what about freeze dried fruit? All these are really crucial questions that our members need to know and we are seeking the answers. So I thought I'd take you through a worked example here. Um, I should say first up, this is really complicated and if you're a retailer, you don't need to know this in this much detail. The important thing is you do need to um, get the overall HFSS status from your supplier. And I would encourage the suppliers on this webinar to provide that information. For those that do need to calculate it, here are some of the things that you need to think about. Um, I have put up uh, an ingredients list here of a vegetable lasagna. Obviously, the manufacturer would know the quantity information. I am just working on what I have to go on here. But um, the first thing I did was to look at the ingredients list and look at the components that would be counted as fruit, veg and nuts. And these I've highlighted here in yellow and made a rough estimation of the quantity based on the, how far down the ingredients list they are. The components highlighted in blue so the dried onion, the onion concentrate and mushroom concentrate and tomato puree are the dried and concentrated components that in a calculation you need to multiply by two. Um, however, in this particular example, they look like to be in minute amounts. So I haven't given it a rough um, value for this particular example. Mushroom powder, I've highlighted just to remind you that this cannot be counted because it's not classed as minimally processed, sadly. And um, for this purpose, I've underestimated slightly as a precaution. But as I say, um, as a retailer, you would have the information from your supplier. So I have worked out in this case, there is 35% fruit, veg and nut in this product. Um, and that is equivalent to zero points for fruit, veg and nut, sadly. Um, just to remember that the fruit, veg and nut threshold scoring is actually quite high. So a product needs to be over 40% fruit, veg and nuts to even score one point on the model. Moving on, I've tried to give you a bit of an example here with dried fruit and nut. As I say, you have to apply a, a multiplication factor, um, but it's not just as simple as times in the dried fruit contribution by two, because you can see um, the blue highlighted section here, dried dates and raisins. If you multiply that contribution by two, you're over 140% um, fruit, veg and nuts, which doesn't work. So the calculation that the guidance tells you you need to do is on screen here. It's more complicated than it, it's less complicated than it looks. So first thing I would do, you work out the non-dried fruit, veg and nut components. So this is 100 gram of product. So I've taken away all the fruit, veg, nut components and it works out to be four grams of 
um, contribution from other ingredients. For the weight of the non-dried fruit and veg, so that's the 18 plus eight plus one, um, that's obviously 27. For the weight of the dried fruit and nut, that's 54 at 15 multiplied by two, which comes out 138. So once you have those figures, you plug them into the calculation and this uh, times it by 100, and this comes out at 98% fruit and veg and nuts. And it will clearly score the full five points uh, in the nutrient profile in fruit, veg, nut contribution. Obviously, don't forget that this isn't the final score. This is what needs to go into the um, model with all the other score, uh, scores from the other components. Okay, um, I am I'm asked about this a couple of um, a couple of times. So nutrient information, if you have uh, on pack nutrient information per 100 mil, so by volume rather than the 100 gram by weight that you need to work the score out for. So firstly, we have asked the Department of Health to give clear guidance on how companies can easily calculate the density of these type of products. So products such as you know, liquid like drinks, um, some ice creams as well give per 100 ml. Um, so we've asked that. In the guidance, it does refer to the math portion size book, which is quite old. Um, you can also get this information from McCants and Willison. In the first instance, as a supplier, I would say that doing the analysis yourself is obviously the most accurate, but as I say, you can get information through McCants and Widdison, and we are asking the DHSC to give um, a guide as to what different types of product would be roughly. So this example is, um, so just an example, um, the specific gravity for vanilla ice cream in the math portion size book is 0.55. So we, um, so if you, that is equivalent to basically 55 grams of ice cream in weight. So the nutrient information on the left is per 100 mil or 55 grams. And I've scaled that up in the um, column on the right to show the nutrient information per 100 grams. And that's what you need to put, um, that's what you need to use when you're doing your nutrient profiling calculation. Um, if this example looks familiar, it is actually in the government technical guidance, and um, it's actually one of the examples that we've gone back to, to the government on because we actually believe it to be slightly incorrect. We think that they've got the tables the wrong way around in the guidance because they're saying that um, 55 grams of ice cream has more calories than 100 grams of ice cream, which doesn't quite make sense. So we have said that back to the government. Another question I get asked a lot is, what nutrient information do I use? So almost all scores should be based on the nutrient information as sold. So even un uncooked frozen products, it's all on as sold. The only exception is products that need reconstitution before consumption. There's a couple of examples there on the right. So custard, cake mixers, drinks powders, and when you do the calculation, the nutrient information you use is the one that you put on pack or on your website to the consumer. So that also needs to include things like if you add an egg, you need the nutrient information of that egg. Or if you add milk, you need to work out the nutrient information of that milk and work it out on a 100 gram basis of the product as made up. Um, there are some products that Andrea has been telling me that retailers have questions about. So ready meals, pizza, potato products um, specifically, there are a lot that label as consume data. Now, in my first instance, I would say go back to your supplier who will know the HFSS status based on as sold data from recipe. I wouldn't advise using that as consume data as a retailer because there might be slight differences in the overall score because of the difference in the nutrient um, density. 
So I would say in first instance, go back to your supplier to get the as sold data. And lastly, um, mixed product packs. So I've pulled out a couple of examples from the promotional legislation guidance that Andrea referred to. So in the first example, you have an in-scope and an out-of-scope product packaged together. The example in the guidance is a ready meal with a separate curry and rice. The guidance states that if either the curry dish, the rice dish, or the product as a whole is HFSS, then it would be subject to restrictions. Um, we have questions about this because that you would think that if the rice part is out of scope, why does that have any bearing on the overall HFSS status? So we've gone back to government to question this. Our suggestion to government is that if the components are eaten together, as they clearly are, the score should be on the nutrient content of the whole product as sold. In example two, in the guidance, it gives a yogurt and granola example. So both components are um, in scope. If either component is HFSS, then it says the whole product would be subject to restrictions. And like I say, I think both of these examples are actually quite difficult because as a consumer, you eat both components together and a lot of the nutrient, the nutrient information on pack that a consumer and a retailer will see is based on the product as a whole. So again, go back to your supplier if you need to know any more information on that. Example three is a little bit more straightforward. So if you've got a hamper or a platter with a mixture of in-scope and out-of-scope components, it could be non-food, it could be alcohol, uh, if one of these products is HFSS, then the whole product, the whole hamper product is restricted. And example four is not in the guidance, but we are, this is something that we've picked out to talk about. So if you've got a multi-pack multi of several items in scope, such as breakfast cereals, crisps, yogurts, there isn't any clear guidance available on how you deal with that. So we have asked government again to clarify this, but we would recommend that if one product is HFSS, you on the same basis as example three, you take a precautionary approach and you treat the total product as HFSS. Okay, this is my final slide. And I just wanted to pick out a few um, of our resources that are available we do have quite a few things, not just available to FDF members, but available publicly as well. So please do put your phone over the QR codes and it will take you to our further information on our website. And I will just have another plug for the nutrient profiling model calculator, which has been really helpful in trying to identify which products are in and out of scope. So please do take my details down and if you think of any questions that aren't answered today or um, that we don't get around to, then please do contact me separately and we'll endeavour to get answers. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Louise. On behalf of everyone listening today, thanks for taking us through the HFSS NPS calculation model. Still so many questions are obviously coming through. Um, Right, one of them is from Marta. Can we stay with declaring as consume nutri values on pack, even though as sold values would be used for the HFSS calculation? Yeah, I mean, because ultimately you, the as the, the information on pack is for the consumer, so you don't want to lose that. But yeah, obviously there is a you do need to know what is as sold as well, but that doesn't have to be visible to the consumer. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Ailing Ahan is asking, I'm confused about the calculation for the naked bar. Some nuts were considered dried fruit and nut, but cashews were non-dried fruit and nut. How do you define both? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have a definitive answer because this is one of the issues that we are asking government to come back to us on. 
in the guidance, all I can say is what's in the guidance at the moment is the guidance only talks about dried fruit and vegetables and the multiplier for those. It doesn't talk about dried nuts. So I would assume that if you're using dried nuts, you just count them once. You don't add in the, the, the multiplier. But we're trying to get clarification on that. OK, I think there are so, so many grey areas, aren't there, that actually makes it such a challenge for suppliers. Um, Richard Henderson has asked, what about chai seeds? Oh, just as I was reading that, my screen jumped. I think it was about chai seeds, flax seeds. Um, I'm so sorry <laughs> that my screen just jumped. Lots of other questions um, came in, but I'm sure the question was around how do they um, contribute to the calculation? Yeah, um, they don't, unfortunately. Um, seeds are not counted. We're asking for clarification as to why not. Um, and I think the slides will be shared after this. So again, I, if there's any questions around what you think is classed as a fruit or a vegetable or a nut, the information is in the further guidance, which is the link that doesn't work in the technical guidance that we put on our website. So I would just refer you to that if there's anything you're not 100% sure about. Great, thank you. Can rapeseed oil be included for the fruit and nut? calculation? No, I don't believe so. Um, again, I would refer you to the guidance. I mean, certainly the... No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't. Okay. What is the definition of a dried nut versus a non-dried nut from Lucy Hammond? There isn't a definition. Um, again, that, that's one of the issues. There isn't a definition of a dried nut. And as I mentioned previously, the guidance only focuses on dried fruit and vegetable. I think it's all to do with the concentration of nutrient. So um, I don't believe this could be I could be wrong, but I don't believe if you've got a nut and you dry it, the nutrients are concentrated because of obviously the water content. So I mean, I'm just guessing here, but I think that's probably why there isn't any reference to nuts. OK, um, why are savoury pastry products not in scope? Um, it makes no sense from Eleanor Brown. <laughs> I think some of this legislation, there are lots of questions around what is and is and isn't in scope. It doesn't make sense. But if you can shed some light, feel free. <laughs> I'll leave that one to Andrea. As uh, Nadia, you just mentioned, there are a lot of things in these legislation that don't make any sense. And it, I'm, I'm just going to add further to the confusion, because as we've said before, and if you look at the general principle of the regulation, it includes products that are regularly promoted, but also that are attractive or generally consumed by children. And there is some of these pastry products, like things like sausage rolls, etc., that are attractive and consumed by small children. So and and they're not in some cases, most nutritious of food. So why are they not included? We can have a, a number of wild guests, but nobody actually really fully knows. Yeah. It, it doesn't, from a public health point of view, really make much of a sense. Yeah, I agree. Sort of, please don't shoot the messengers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard and his last, oh, oh gosh, I've got so many questions coming in. I'm so sorry, they keep leaping from top to bottom. Um, I think it was about, what about uh, freeze-dried fruit nut powders, which are known to preserve more nutrients than the canned products? Quite a few people are interested in that. Yeah, I think under the guidance, it would be classed as not minimally processed if it's powdered. Um, but that's something we're asking for clarity on because obviously freeze-dried fruits and nutrient retention and the um, concentration of nutrients, obviously, would make it a really good choice of things to put in your product. So I'm sorry, I can't give you the full answers to everything, but it just shows just how complex this is. And it's great that you keep, that, that you all highlight all of this information here because it's something that we can um, all, you know, collate and take back to government. Okay, where does sports nutrition, oh, just, I'm so sorry. Honestly, my screen, you were all very active. Where does sports nutrition fit in with the categories? As they're fortified to high level, does this exempt them, particularly as they're often sold in pharmacy area of the stores? That's from Sandy Brand. No. I'm afraid the answer is no. Mm. 
they're not exempt. A number of years ago, uh, the commission made it very clear that there is not such a thing as legally defined as sports foods. They either have to become or be defined in the one category or otherwise they're just general foods. So your products will need to or you would need to establish whether your specific product fits in one of the 13 categories. So if it is a, let's say, high protein shake, for example, it would be part of category one. If they are things like protein bars, uh, they would be classified depending on their content as a biscuit or confectionery. You would have to establish whether based on the criteria they're in or out of the scope. But I'm afraid, um, yeah, generally known as sports foods um, would not be exempt from the provisions of the regulation. Fantastic. Can I, can I add something to that, actually? It just reminded me mm. about protein. So if you are able to reformulate, and I know a lot of categories can't, um, one of the things that you should be thinking about is the protein content of your product. So if your A points only just meet that 11 point threshold or slightly over, it could be that you can try and reformulate to get below that 11 and then you can count for your protein. So that is a potential route for reformulation. And I know it's really difficult because there are lots of categories that can't actually go down that route, but yeah, just something to think about. Okay, I've got another question from Stacey Watt. We manufacture a cheese product, which is sold with a savory snack to dip. Um, the cheese is obviously out of scope, but the snack would be in scope. Would the overall product be in scope? We have been informed that these would be exempt. However, according to your slides, Louise, we might now have to treat these as being in scope. Please clarify. Um, I think that's probably more for Andrea, but I would say that it is in scope if the, no, it's not. Okay, do you want to elaborate? We have discussed these for hours at a time. And we believe uh, we've settled and we've had quite extensive discussions with uh, our primary authorities as well. And we've come to the conclusion that they are out of scope. We've also asked the question, I should say, to the Department of Health about eight weeks ago. We haven't got an answer yet, but we believe at this moment in time they're out of scope because they would, if in scope, they would be in category two as a savoury snack. But we believe that given the ratio of the part of the product that is in or out of a scope and the fact that you should look at the product as a whole um these products and the fact that the products are chilled the majority of the snacks would be ready to eat or not need for further preparation not every single one of the varieties has an element that is in scope so the overall um general consensus is that most of these type of products are out of the scope obviously we cannot say all it will have to be determined on an individual basis but we believe most of them are out of scope Okay, thank you. Roasted and salted nuts, are they in or out? Out. Out. Okay, lovely. Um, we have started, Cameron from Marsden has said, we have started HFSS. When when there is still so many things that are, are, are correct and out of date, should we wait until everything is defined before we start work and then need to change things? <sighs> I wouldn't advise that. I think obviously the 1st of October is, will be upon us before we know it. So the best that we can advise is we go on what guidance is available now. And if there's anything that you specifically need, we will try and collate that maybe between us, Andrea and, um, yeah. and Nadia, and we'll, we'll go back to government with outstanding questions, which we have, it, it's been a process that we've been doing, you know, on and off for quite a while now. And they are, we are getting some, some answers. So, you know, send them on and we can see what we can do. I think yeah. one of the key things to also uh, mention is it's the retailers who are liable. Okay. So if you do not, as a supplier, provide your retailers with the information, they will, in most cases, have to take the safe option and remove your product from any of the areas that are HFSS restricted. So better Correct. to provide them with, yeah, provide them with your calculation as it stands now, giving them the information that allows them to do all of this in-store planning and also all, all the online planning. Absolutely. And I would echo that. I think what we have to bear in mind is that the date of compliance is 1st of October, but to get to that date, this we have to work backwards as a retailer and get to that compliant date, having done all the different formatting, different in some cases, there is some extensive uh, featuring work that has to 
take place in store as well as all the algorithm work that goes on on the website. So we really pretty much need the information on product now. Um, so I would urge you to, if in doubt, talk to your primary authority, talk to your trade organization, use your common sense, potentially even look at worst case scenario, work through um, you know, what do you think uh, your product is talk to the retailer or the retailers that you're supplying, they'll be able to provide you with some guidance. Uh, there is several routes through which you can get a little bit closer to the answer, but please don't leave it until we'll get answers because my gut feeling is, I don't think we're gonna get some answers even by the 1st of October. I think the process through to get clarity has been uh, for some of us quite lengthy and, and not necessarily very successful at times. Yeah, and as, as you said, it's a huge amount of work for the retailers to do. Um, if you haven't used product DNA, by all means, get in touch with GS1 and we can help you get your information through to those who are participating. I know that's not all retailers, but there, you know, there are resources available to help you. Mm -hmm. um, probably one more quick question. Does fruit juice that is from concentrated but is reconstituted to the definition of fruit juice and nectar's legislation count as fruit? Maybe um, it wasn't a quick one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to give you incorrect information, so I will come back to you on that one. Um, I think it's it's likely that it is classed as not minimally processed, but I wouldn't want to say that and and you know be negative. But yeah, I think that that is this that is the case. Okay, I am conscious of the time. Um, there are so many open questions, still I think about 90 something open questions. I'm mm. so sorry to all of you who have posed questions that we weren't able to answer. Thank you very much. As I said, we will maybe do another Q&A session simply to answer mm. all of those, but we will find a way of getting the information to you. It just leaves me to thank both Louise and Andrea for excellent presentations. Um, hopefully we provided everybody with some information and insights that are going to help them with the calculations. Uh, if you have any additional questions about HFSS, as I said, you can get in touch with any one of us or through each of our organisations. Um, you will, as I said in the beginning, you will get a follow up email and you'll have the link to the videos. We split the videos so that there's a little bit easier to digest and navigate. Um, but then that will come in the next few days. Now I just all I have to say is thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a lovely rest of the day and say goodbye for now. Thank you for your time. <laughs>